What's going on guys? Welcome to this week's episode of Merrick's Garage. As always, I got a ton of stuff for you guys. Make sure to hit that subscribe button, like button. Go check out merricksgarage.com. You can pick up a hat like this and others, even t-shirts and stickers. Today, I'm giving you guys a behind the scenes on what it takes to make a YouTube video. What I'm actually gonna do is not do a ton of editing and just show you what I've got because I have run out of time. It's been a crazy couple weeks. My kids got me sick. The holiday seasons are upon us with all the parties, parades, events, and all the stuff that comes with it. I'm not complaining. I love this time of year. It's my favorite time of year. And uh, I've also got about five different projects going on at once with the truck. Sway bar calculations, painting, welding, uh, analyzing, link lengths, running electrical, and they're all kind of spread out and I haven't had a chance to boil them down into a seamless, perfectly flowing video uh, that makes me look well-spoken and somewhat semi-intelligent. So we're gonna stumble and bumble through this one together. It's still gonna be fun, but don't look for all my crazy editing. Let's go see what we got going on. You see, I think this is part of my problem. I, uh, I go for like fractions of a degree perfection. And I just don't think I'm gonna be able to get it with this. Well, maybe I will. I mean, maybe that's why it takes me so long is I just really, really, really overanalyze things. So, right here. This is where these guys want to go. This is going to be about an inch above axle center line, 30 degrees on this side. I'll take you over to the other side to take a look here in a second. But in addition to that, I've also locked down the pinion, 12 and a quarter uh, to 15, so about three degrees. That's perfect. That will keep the needle bearings moving. And these guys are almost flat right eye perfect. Well, it's a little bit downhill. So, 31 degrees. Let's go take a look. Let's go take a look at the other side. Now, if this lines up, it's gonna mean that I have my pinion angle right, and I have my outside link arms right, and my center links right. So I can start getting work done on the axle. Fingers crossed. Oh. <laughs> I'll take that. A couple hundredths of a degree off. Yeah. Okay. Let's put some heavy tacks on these guys. I've got a clean project this weekend, which is awesome. Not making a ton of noise, not getting all dirty. Instead, I'm painting everything. Painting stuff is always fun because generally means you're getting close to the end of the project. Now, I have um, not reached the end of the project, but I am getting close, and it's time to start really laying down some heavy paint on some of the parts. And that gets me to an important part of, of any build, which is going to be the preparation and the preservation of the products and things that you make. I have gone through pretty much every type of paint that I could buy at the hardware store, from um, the Rust-Oleum like uh, coatings that you put down that are supposed to be like bed coatings, to the high temperature paints, to uh, PUR-15, and I'm now trying steel it. So let's quickly go through drawbacks, features, benefits of all those different paints, because painting your stuff after you've built it is paramount to making it last looking good and uh being able to see problems on it if you don't paint it you don't take care of it it's going to corrode you're not gonna be able to see anything on it so always throw a good coat of paint on there now a lot of guys out there will take it down to a professional painter and get it sprayed or get it powder coated uh, for my budget and what i'm doing with the build it's just not really an option for me uh, spray paint, particularly the cheaper spray paint, has been my go-to for years. But obviously, cheaper spray paint is a cheaper paint job. And you'll find yourself painting it over and over. Which isn't a big problem when it's on some big part like the axle tube. But when you start getting down to little things like axle brackets and uh, link connections, masking off everything to get a good coat of paint on there is uh, not really that convenient. And then also prep. You've got to prep that piece before you paint it if you want a good bite between the paint and the part itself. 
So, what have I used in the past? Uh, I've used a lot of just spray paints. You guys know how those work. I'm not going to get into spray paints. There's some good, there's some bad. I've had good luck with the VHT, uh, the very high temperature paint. Uh, I've used that on the engine block and brakes and transmission and transfer case, and they've held up fairly well. Uh, they are starting to pit and peel, but it's been a couple years, so it's not that bad. The Rust-Oleum bed liner. Meh. Yeah. It's not cheap. It's like 12 bucks a can. The cans don't have that much in them. And it doesn't really seem to last that long. So get rid of that idea. POR15. POR15 is bad stuff. It's gnarly. Uh, especially if you hit it with the acid etch and their degreaser. And then hit it with the POR15 and then apply a top coat to the top. You've got a bomber. Bomber coating. It only comes in black though, and it's not weldable, which leads me to steal it. I have been looking at steel it for a long time. It's not cheap. Steel it costs about 30 bucks a can. But the cans have a lot of paint in them, which is fortunate because for steel it to work effectively, you're gonna have to apply three, four, five coats. That's the recommendation in a seriously, seriously thick amount too. Um, that's kind of what I love about it. It dries really, really, really well. Um, and the steel it stuff, I'll, I'll get into the details in a little bit later in the videos, but the steel it stuff is fantastic. And they've come out with black. I haven't got my hands on the black yet, but I'm hoping to get a case of the black so I can do the frame and various things. But I have been able to do the truss. I've been able to do my links. And come check it out. My paint booth, really, really nice. You'll see here. But this, this is... My links. I welded them all up yesterday and sprayed them with POR. No. I laid them all up and welded them in yesterday. See, everything got burned in. Uh, and then I hit them with some 160 grit sandpaper and then 35 grit sandpaper. So I had a really rough surface for this stuff to uh, adhere to. And the way that it uh, lays down is really nice. I don't need these things to look perfect, but I do want them to look good. And with the steel, it, this stuff is like impenetrable. It is a stainless steel paint. So anti-rust stainless steel in a can. And it really, it really is that good. Um, this, what you see right here. So my axle truss, these four links and my brake adapters, this took four cans. I don't think that's that bad, especially considering that this stuff got about five coats of paint. So it is a bomber. But that's where we stand. That's what this weekend has been about. It's been pulling the axle, getting things ready, painting stuff, and I'm loving it. It's so nice to paint and not be uh, making a huge mess right now. There we are. Okay, here goes nothing. Um, gonna do some heavy tacks on the axle truss down here to get the um, get everything burned in and lined up and ready to go. The axle has been sprayed in steel it black. The axle truss has been sprayed in steel it silver. I'm supposed to be able to weld right through it. Let's see what happens.
I've uh, used the steel it extensively. This is some good, good stuff. I will say that welding it directly it did not produce the best welds. Now, I don't produce the best welds, so there's that. But uh, also, it was difficult to strike a, strike a spark. It didn't want to immediately start welding. It was like I had a bad ground, which makes sense because there was paint on it. Stainless steel or not, it still got paint on it. Um, so my welds came out pretty lumpy. But, you know, like I've said before, I'm not a welder. I just want it to be strong. And it's going to be strong. But uh, here you can see it's all painted up. And the next stage here is to go back under the truck and start putting the shocks in, start putting the bumps in, get the links mounted. Um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, I think I'm on the home stretch or I'm over the hump at this point, but let's do an inventory of what I think I still have to get done. Is I think the frame is going to remain in here. It's in so well that the benefit of getting it out to weld some stuff onto it really seems to be outweighed by the fact that it is going to be a lot of work to get it back out and the fact that it's in perfectly i'm just going to leave it where it is so what i still have to do to the frame obviously i'm gonna to have to paint it um that's not gonna be that big of a deal um but i'm also going to need to be putting the bump stop mounts on i'm going to need to put the gas tank back in run all the wiring plumbing uh link mount brackets for the shocks things like that not a ton of welding um but I think it's gonna be easier if it stays in. It's quite a bit of work by myself to get it out. And like I said, the fact that it's in so perfectly right now should not be underestimated. So where does that leave me? Um, I've got about four projects that are running simultaneously. I'm, I'm doing my calculations for the sway bar. I am um, figuring out all of my electrical. I'm doing all the, the welding and the design and uh, math calculations for the link geometry, uh, bracket mount, separation angle, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then I've got all the plumbing and wiring to do. So of those, I think um, what my next plan of attack is to get the axle back under here. With the axle back under, I'm gonna take a hard look at exactly where I want the shocks to go. I don't really want the shocks hanging down super low. If I end up putting them up on the axle tube and putting them up through the floor, it's not that big of a deal. I've looked at where they're gonna go. They're gonna appear right behind the rear bench. So I'll lose a little bit of cargo area, but nothing much. So that's on the agenda for this weekend, cutting the floor. Uh, what else is on the agenda? My electrical harness is going to be finished here shortly. I have the passenger side tail light to wire up and off of that wire I'm going to have um, a pigtail coming down for the reverse, uh, not the reverse, for the trailer. So I'll have a trailer plug too. That's almost done. You can see the wiring harness that I've shown you guys before coming up in here. It's all uh, got one for the license plate this one this is what comes down this is going to split up into here here is the lights that i've got to connect you can see i've already got a common ground going for all of them so the next part is going to be running this into the common ground uh so the wiring's wiring's coming together well the fueling and brakes i haven't really even started tackling that stuff yet that is going to get some attention here pretty pretty soon because I need to start figuring out lengths, diameters, uh, do I want a different proportioning valve, um, how do I want to run it, do I want hard line as much as I can, do I want stainless braided, uh, and then the gas tank, do I want an in-tank pump, I'll, I'll be honest, project creep is a real thing and once you get your truck taken down, it becomes very easy to go, well, I'm just going to do this one thing. I'm just going to add this on. And before you know it, the truck's down for three years. I am itching to get this thing back on the road, back on the trail. I, I love driving it. It's, it's a blast. And it's been several months since I've had the opportunity. So I am at this point looking to take uh, the quickest path to getting it back up. Obviously not doing anything that, uh, that I don't like, but using the factory fueling system, it's always worked well. 
there's no point in replacing it. So the factory tank's gonna go back in, factory pump's gonna go back in, uh, inline filter and um, returnless system will go back in. Um, what else is there? Bumper, rear end, all that kind of stuff. That will come when the truck is up and running. Um, the sway bar, sway bar is gonna be ordered here soon. Uh, but you can see there, there's just tons of different directions going on. I'm kind of scattered right now. Um, hence my babbling at the camera. But uh, a lot on my plate, a lot of stuff coming up. And like always, I, I really appreciate all the comments I get below. They do add clarity and, um, and help me make decisions. Uh, I often read, you know, what people write and, and find a little gem in there of stuff that I could be doing differently. So I totally appreciate it. Um, got a couple more things to show you guys. So let's go take a look at those. I am a geek when it comes to fasteners. These guys. I love finding or getting the best fasteners I can for the job at hand. And there's a reason. They're fairly inexpensive. They can make a huge difference in the performance of uh, the part that you're using in terms of fatigue, strength, and things like that. They're mission critical, and they can look really cool. But there are a wide variety of fasteners, from zinc-coated grade eights to serrated button caps. These are grade five, I believe. Um, I'm going into Santa Barbara Fasteners here. I love coming down to the store. They've always got so much stuff that I just go in, what I'm looking for, and uh, we end up coming out with a bunch of good fasteners. So let's head in there right now. We'll take a look and see what we can find. Another productive run down to the fastener store. I love coming down to this place. It's nothing like putting new fasteners on rebuilt stuff. I mean, they're so relatively inexpensive it's it's just worth doing if you ask me okay a little bit more sway bar tech there's a lot of companies that make sway bars um, they come in a variety of sizes thicknesses strengths widths arm lengths all that kind of thing but in my research what I found is most of the companies that make them limit them down to about four or five options I found a company called Speedway Engineering. Actually, Stephen at Off-Road Design turned me onto it. And I can buy the raw parts I need. I can buy my own um, sway bar. Um, I can choose the thickness, the material, the arm lengths, all that kind of stuff. So I've got some more math to do. And that's what I've been focusing on trying to get figured out. Here's the things that I'm working with. You've got a sway bar that's going to run longitude or laterally across the truck. Think of that sway bar as an axle shaft. It's gonna have very, very similar properties. It's gonna be splined. It's gonna be made out of 4340 steel. It's gonna be very uh, strong and it's gonna allow for some torsional resistance. That's like an axle shaft will allow for a little bit of wind up before it snaps. And each degree is measured uh, or five degrees. What they state on the website is every five degrees of movement or, or rotation is going to take a certain amount of force and depending on the thickness, depending on the material, depending on the length, depending on the link arm, how much force that takes is going to change. I have determined that I'm probably going to end up needing about a 16 inch arm. Let me show you where I came up with that number for. That's going to come from right here. This is where I'm hoping to put my sway bar to the axle is roughly 16 inches. Now I'm gonna be able to cheat it and, and move it um, forward of the axle a little bit if I need to. <clears throat> but the next thing to figure out is what degrees I'm gonna be running through when the sway bar is in action. And here's what I've landed on. What I'm gonna be measuring here is as my sway bar arm moves up, what does that correlate into a degree change? If I have eight inches of up travel and eight inches of down travel, it's hypothetically possible that 
my bar could see 16 inches of deflection, meaning if I'm at full articulation, passenger side drops all the way down, driver side stuffs all the way up, that's going to be a combined, actually it's, it's 14 inches, it's going to be a combined 14 inches of travel, 14 inches of, of torque or torsion running through that shaft. How many degrees does that represent is something I've got to figure out. Uh, basic calculations here. Let's see if I can get it right. Imagine this is my link arm. This is my arm. This is the fulcrum point around which the sway bar moves. This is static. So right in the middle of the travel, seven inches. As the sway bar articulates up through compression, it's gonna rotate around this fulcrum point. I've got my 16 inch arm. So rotating up to here is gonna leave me That gets me 157, so that's roughly 22 degrees. Running through 14 inches of travel with a 16 inch link arm is gonna result in roughly 42 degrees of uh, torsional rotation. So 42 degrees, if it's five degrees per 500 pounds or something like that, I'll, I'll look at the chart here in a second and figure it out, but that's where I'm landing. This gives me a rough baseline as to where to start from. Okay, I'm gonna ask that you bear with me here because this is my, the rough calculations. So look at this drawing that I've done right here. You will see like this is gonna be the sway bar. This is the link arm I'm talking about. This is how it connects down to the axle. This arc swing right here is coming in at 40 degrees. I, I'm, I'm roughly bringing that down to 40 degrees. Five goes into 40 degrees eight times. So whatever weight they give me for a five degree twist, I'm gonna multiply it by eight times to determine how much weight it's gonna take to move at that full range. So off the drawings that I've got and the numbers that I'm pulling from the chart that I'll show you, I'm running into about 3,000 pounds at a 375 pound uh, per five degree uh, rate. If I use a smaller bar and it drops down to 326 pounds, that gets me to about 2,600 pounds to go through the full 40 degrees. And my truck weighs 6,700 pounds using a rough estimate of a 60-40 weight split means the rear end is coming in around 2680, 2700 pounds. Using that logic, it looks like this bar would be the better bar to get. And on the corresponding spreadsheet that, uh, that I pulled down that you'll see right here, you can see that um, the 250 wall, 15 inch link arm on the one inch 48 spline is coming in at 326 pounds. That is looking like my go-to. I'm not totally sure, but uh, that's the math that I've run with, and that's where I seem to be ending up.